Thank you so much for participating in the 7th Annual Walk for Suicide Awareness here at Hydro Park in Kakana. And, uh, well, at this time, as I've been mentioning, we have a special guest uh, who has uh, got some outstanding things to uh, talk about. And uh, that would be Brittany Cooley, who is a beach body coach, and she is here to tell us about some of her life's experiences. So let's give her a big round of applause. Brittany. Hi, how is everyone today? It's a beautiful day, isn't it? It's really nice outside. We like it. Uh, it's amazing that it got such a turnout because this is such an important cause. Um, it's a cause that's very near and dear to my heart because I am a suicide survivor, so I hope that so, like everyone's been saying, my name is Brittany Cooley. I am from New Jersey. I've been here. Um, I lived there for three years, so I'm here today from there. Uh, it's such an honor. I'm so thankful. I just want to thank Barb um, for giving me this opportunity uh, to be here with your community today. It's been beautiful, and I've met so many wonderful people, so I'm really excited to connect for that. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life and kind of share with you my tragedy to triumph. Um, I'm 27 years old and I am a future published author. Um, my book, Strength Personified, will hopefully, fingers crossed, be published in the spring of 2017. Um, so my story actually begins about 19 years ago. I want to tell you about my mom. My mom was amazing. She was the executive director of a nonprofit organization. She was beautiful, intelligent. She had a big, beautiful five bedroom home with a pool. She was the best mom to a little girl who never needed anything. But she struggled with depression really bad and her job got really stressful and it was just too much one day and she broke. She broke because she didn't have coping skills. She just worked too hard and never talked about her problems. So that we lost that big beautiful five bedroom home and we had to move in with my grandparents. And that's fine. My grandparents are wonderful people and she just had to get better. So fast forward a little bit, in January of 1997, um, that happened in November. So in January, um, I got off the bus one day from school. This, I'm from Northeastern Pennsylvania, so it's snowy, cold, probably a lot like winter here in Wisconsin. Um, I got off the bus, walked through the door. My grandma was like, where's your mom? I don't know, I just got off the bus and came home like I always do, right? And so later that night, my aunt came to pick me up and I was gonna go stay with her for a while because mom was sick and she needed to get better. Um, but it wasn't until later, years later, that I found out what really happened that night. Um, so her car was found over, uh, pulled over on the side of the road. I'm from a really rural area, so it was a dirt road. And um, she was found face down in the snow. She had overdosed on her antidepressant medications and attempts to take her life by suicide. Pulled her out of the woods. She was severely frostbitten, hanging on by a thread, but they saved her and she survived. She was a warrior. But, you know, she looked like my mom and she sounded like my mom. She physically recovered, but her mind was never the same because of the chemical imbalances um, that the medication has caused. So things were getting a little bit better. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to 1998. It was my last day of third grade. She picked me up. We were going to go to the beach. It was our favorite place to be together. So I felt like I was getting my mom back. I thought things were going to be great. Um, my grandparents were monitoring everything. She was doing a lot better. I thought everything was going to be okay. We ended up in Pensacola, Florida for the next five years. The first three years were okay. She cashed in her big retirement that she had from working for that company for so long. And we lived pretty well, but she burned through that quickly. And with her mental illness, she mimicked it symptoms of schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia. So if you know what that is, it's paranoid delusions, you know, hallucinations. She felt that God was telling her to do things that obviously any God that anybody would worship or follow would not tell them to do. We lost everything again. I lost our apartment, lost everything, and we were destitute. So the last two years I was in Florida, we were homeless. And she cut off all contact with my family. And we would go weeks without eating a decent meal. We would go months without a shower or a place to sleep. Um, it was really hard, but I never left her. And, and many of you are probably like, well, why didn't you ever reach out to your family? They would have, you know, came and found you. And they absolutely would have. I could have made a phone call. I could have sent one single smoke signal, and I would have been saved. But I was mom's girl. I wanted to stay with my mom. And it was me and her against the world. And at a young age, I was eight years old, eight, nine years old, 10 years old, 11, 12, 13, 14. I knew, I was very parentified, and I knew that if I left her, nobody would take care of her and she would die. So I wanted to stay with her because it was her and me against, you and me against the world, babe. So I stayed with her, but I got really tired. 
When I was 14 years old, I hadn't been enrolled in school. I'd missed fourth or eighth grade. She would say that I was homeschooled when she was asked, but I was never went to school. So I got really tired when I woke up as 14, her couch surfing and people from church, um, living out of the car, spending nights at rest areas, days during like bookstores, Books A Million, Barnes and Noble, um, because they're big and air conditioned and Florida is really hot in the summertime. Um, and you know, we just was surviving and I thought, you know, God, I'm really tired, like I just want to go home, I just want to be taken care of, you know. So I made a decision to write a letter. I love my mom, but I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I gave up. So I wrote a letter, and within two weeks, a caseworker that had been looking for me for three years found me, uh, willingly. I had been ditching her for a long time, so she was very excited to find me and, and put me into the foster care system. I had to be put into foster care for two months before the court settled, before I could be flown back to my dad. So during those two months of foster care, I was exposed to both physical and sexual abuse by my foster siblings. I was really regretting leaving my mom. That car and that parking lot was looking really good because it was bad. But finally, the court settled and I was put on a plane and my dad picked me up at Scranton Airport in Pennsylvania and I got to go home. I had a room, I had a house, I had my family. Let's talk about school. Uh, I had missed fourth or eighth grade. I would have been 14 going into ninth grade, and they were like, you don't have any transcripts. You don't know anything. You know, I missed, I didn't know times tables. I didn't know division. I didn't know geography. I didn't know all of those things that you learn in those grades. So how was I supposed to go into ninth grade, right? Well, my aunt, thankfully, was close to the school board and said, just give her a chance. You're gonna have to work really hard. It's not gonna be easy, but just try. So they gave me a chance, and I'm stubborn. Like, if you guys haven't like learned that already about me, about this, like what's going on in my life, I'm really stubborn. Like, I don't like people telling me that I can't do something because then I really do it, like really hard. So I did, I did. I went and I, I studied and I made it. I mean, I never really made honor roll or anything. Um, I never was, I didn't get straight A's by any means, but I passed and I did my best. And I graduated on time in 2007 with my high school diploma. I just did it. So, thank you. Yes, I'm so excited. Like a C average, but I was really proud of that C average. <laughs> so then I wanted to go to college because I felt like mom's still in Florida, by the way. So I wanted to go to college because I wanted to help people. I wanted to be a social worker. I wanted to help kids that went through the things that I did. I felt that that was my job. I understood people. I was good at people. And I understood what they felt like. And I knew how terrible it was. So I wanted to be like that caseworker that saved me. I wanted to be that person. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. I knew I wasn't going to make any money, but it was going to make me feel like I mattered. I was doing something good for the world because I had left my mom and I already felt really bad about that still. So college was hard to get into because I had terrible SAT scores because of my schooling, but I found the Lock Haven University Educational Opportunities Program and they allowed me to take summer classes and if I passed, I would be admitted into the fall semester. So I did that and I got admitted into the fall semester, 2007, graduating class of 2011. Got through my freshman year then my sophomore year, the weekend before classes started, I got arrested for underage drinking. Awesome, good job, Brittany. I was freaking out, so I was like, my dad's gonna kill me. He's gonna kill me. Um, but two days later, I got a phone call. That was August 23rd, 2008. And then two days later, I got a phone call and said that my mom was found that day, the day I got arrested, um, 83 pounds, destitute, on the streets of Florida, internally hemorrhaging. They gave her six pints of blood. And worked on it for six hours. There was nothing they could do. And so I felt really bad about that. Really bad. I internalized that and felt like it was my fault. I always said, if I left her, she's going to die. I told my dad that from the time I came home, I got off the airplane. I'm like, mom's going to die because I left her. I felt so guilty. And I was drunk at a party, getting arrested. She was dying. So I felt really bad about that. But remember, Brittany's stubborn. I'm really stubborn. So... I got through it. I put on my big girl pants. I went home. I buried my mother next to my grandfather, and I went back to school. I met with the dean about my underage drinking. I swear to God, that wouldn't happen again. And I went on because now I really had to be a social worker and save people because I failed miserably. So I graduated in 2007, or 2011, sorry, with my bachelor's degree in social work so I could put my cape on and save all these kids and make myself feel better about all of this that had happened in my life. I never really excelled at anything, and this was gonna be my thing. This was gonna be my thing that I was really good at helping people, saving people, putting my cape on, being superwoman like my mom was before she got sick. 
So three months after I graduated, I got my dream job in my hometown. I got offered a casework position. They're hard to come by because working for the state of Pennsylvania is very difficult. Well, I had been bottling all of my crap, all my shit, <laughs> um, for a long time. I hadn't talked about it. I'm dealing with it. My coping skills were drinking alcohol and eating, binge eating. Suffered from binge eating disorder because I have a scarcity mindset because, you know, there was not always a time where I had food. So I still have it in the back of my head that when there's food, I have to eat all of it because I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat tomorrow. So I struggled with binge eating. I gained 35 pounds in college. I was heavy. I was unhealthy. I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. I was drinking a case and a half of beer a week. Really destructive coping skills, right? But, but I was going to do it. I got my job, and I was going to do a really good job. Well, three months into that job, I realized that I really hated it. I couldn't do it. It was too hard. I felt like I was failing, you know. It stacks of files on my desk and people calling, yelling at me, and this was not what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be a hero, and I was failing, right? So I felt like a big failure. Failed my calling. Failed my mom. Wasn't really good at anything. Didn't really have much to offer the world. That was in my head. So I broke, just like my mom. I had nervous breakdown. Well, oh, on July 17, 2012, I was really, really happy. I found peace because I realized what I had to do to make it all go away. All the pain was going to be gone, and I was going to be at peace finally. My life had been so hard. Poor Brittany. She had a hard life. Nothing has ever been easy. She's had to fight through everything, and I was tired. I was really tired. I just wanted it to stop. I really hated who I was looking at in the mirror. I hated her. I just wanted her to go away. You don't think about anybody else. You just think about yourself. Right? So on July 17, 2012, I hadn't gone to work in like four days. I just, just quit going to work. I don't care. I didn't care. I didn't even call out. I just didn't show up. Stop caring. Woke up. Kissed my boyfriend goodbye. He went to work. At the time. Still now single. Just don't know out there. Um, kissed my boyfriend goodbye, made a cup of coffee, I wrote a letter, but then I ripped to be left next to me, but I ripped it up because I didn't want to be dramatic, because I figured that my family would expect this, I thought of my family, but I figured they would expect this, because poor Brittany, her life had been hard, she ended up just like her mother, I wasn't offering the world any good, right, I was doing anything meaningful, I failed my calling, I failed everything I ever tried, so they would just... It was just, they would see it coming, and it wouldn't be a thing. That was in my head. So I walked into the kitchen, and I grabbed a knife, the sharpest one, the sharpest, the sharpest knife. And I don't, I don't really know, I don't, I don't remember much of what was happening next, but I just remember a very overwhelming pile, puddle of blood on the floor. It was really bad. And then I remember the EMTs and the police, by the grace of God, breaking down my door and rushing up and putting me in a stretcher and putting me in the ambulance. This whole time, I'm like in and out, but I'm just thinking like, I just don't want to get alive to the hospital. Like, when is it going to just go out? When is it going to stop? I just want it to stop. I do not want to look like it's over. Like, I just want it to be over. But I made it to the hospital. It was like 16 miles away, so it was kind of far. Um, but I made it to the hospital and they transported me from the ambulance on to, into the emergency room, put me on the table, prepping me for surgery. There's a team of surgeons, six doctors, a, man, a guy with an anesthesia mask waiting to put me out. And then the doctor asked me, do you have anybody that we can call for you? And then I thought of my dad, and I was like, oh my God. Didn't think about it. Didn't think. That's when my light came back. That light that was gone, it came right back, real bright, real fast. Uh, so my dad, so I gotta tell you about my dad. I love my dad. This man is the most amazing person in the whole world. I love him more than anything. And I thought of him getting that phone call. His little girl. What had happened to his little girl? Then I saw him burying me next to my mother. I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? It was almost too late. So I told that doctor to call my dad and tell him I'm really sorry and I love him very much. And I told him he better do his job. So my voice. But then I went out and I was put under. Oh, by the grace of God, I woke up. I woke up in the 
guys. You, 3 a.m. 26 staples in my stomach. The tubes in every hole. Every hole that you have in your body, I had a tube there. And I had an epidural on my back. But I was alive. And it was that moment that I was like, I knew that I always had a lot of hard things to face in my near future. It's not gonna be easy to get through this. I was really gonna have to deal with all that shit that I never dealt with. I really was gonna have to. It was serious. But I was gonna do it because I decided that, I realized when I was in the hospital, I realized that nobody was coming to save me. Nobody, there was nobody. I had to find the will and the motivation to save myself. And I had to do it. And I had to do it to create a life that I loved to live. And I realized that I had the power to do that. Like, why am I doing all this stuff that I hate doing? Why am I in a relationship that makes me miserable? Why do I have friends that make me feel bad about myself? I have control over all of that. Why am I working a job that I hate? Just because I found a job that I hate doesn't mean I can't find one that I love. So I decided that I had a lot of work to do and I had to make a lot of changes, a lot of big changes, a lot of big, scary, really uncomfortable changes. But I was gonna make them and I was gonna make my dad proud and promise him for the rest of my life that I was gonna be okay and that he was gonna be okay and I was gonna make a life that my mom and I would love to live together. After I was cleared from the ICU, I was put in the psych, the psych unit for six to seven days. Then upon that release, I was given the diagnosis of major depressive disorder and put on a slew of medications. Everyone knows everyone, so everybody knew Brittany, everybody knew what happened to Brittany within like three seconds of it happening. And I overheard somebody in the community speaking about me to somebody else. They knew me, I knew them. They said, yeah, that's poor, poor Linda's daughter. She ended up, you know, she's had a really hard life. Poor girl ended up just like her mom. I don't know that she'll be ever, ever be able to do anything again. And you know, I heard she was trying to cut out her own unborn child. Well, I can proudly say and stand here and tell you guys today that I have proudly built this pretty coolie that's standing in front of you. I chose to be a victor and not a victim. I chose the hard road. I could have pushed the easy button and been that victim and, and, and just rolled over and, and let life just go on because I could have. Everyone felt sorry for me. My life would have been easy, but I chose what was hard so I could create something incredible. And now I have the opportunity to share this with you today and spread awareness. I mean, I am a beach body coach. A lot of you are like a beach body girl, but I'm so much more than that, guys. Beach body has changed my life. And in the past two and a half years with my binge eating disorder, it's helped me regain self-confidence, lost 56 pounds. I quit smoking after 11 years. Um, I found the confidence to like speak in front of people because I failed public speaking in college almost. You know, I failed business 101 and now I'm an entrepreneur. I work for myself. I'm a health and fitness coach through Beachbody, but I, you know, I'm a CEO. I'm a CEO of the Warrior Republic. And, you know, I chose, I chose what was hard so I could create what I wanted. Since those of you who have lost people to suicide, I'm so sorry. I feel that pang of regret every time I look at my dad because I know what I put him through. It was the worst mistake I could have ever made, but when you don't deal with your stuff, it just it really eats your life. And you don't want to live. But you're not thinking about anybody else. You're thinking about yourself. That darkness is just there. And there's nothing that you can do to prevent it once it gets to that point. It's just that last drop. I heard Barb over, over say that it's just the last drop in the glass that overfills it. And that's exactly, exactly what happens. I'm so sorry. My heart is with you today and always, always. And if anybody's ever, you know, had suicidal ideation or thought about ending their life, I want you guys to know that life sucks. Like for real, it does. It's gonna let, kick the ever loving crap out of you probably more than once. But I want you to know that there's a solution to every single problem that you face. There's always an answer. It might not be easy. You're gonna have to look at those things that you're really afraid of. You're gonna have to embrace those. You're gonna have to deal with that hard stuff that happens. You're gonna have to deal with it. But. On the other side of fear lies freedom and there's always hope. Because it is my mission to share my struggles with you. But I have used my struggles to build my greatest strengths. If I can leave you guys with anything today, anything at all, if you, you know, if you never even remember my name, that's okay. If I can leave you guys with anything, it's that just don't ever accept defeat. There's always, there's always hope. There's always a way to figure it out. If you want something in life, you need to get it. If you're unhappy with something, you need to change it. Because you have the power to do that. That's just something I didn't realize. I thought that I just had to deal with the cards that life dealt me. But no, you don't. 
my cards were not very good, as you can tell. My, I, didn't, I don't have a lot of good accolades leading up to this. There's always hope, and I'm just really thankful to have this opportunity to travel and speak and share this with you. So thank you guys so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Brittany Cooley. Let's give her another big round of applause.